This is uh, Morten from Inkis TV, and I am so delighted today. I'm going to talk to two good friends. I would uh, I would take my chances to call them that. Uh, we have David Swang and we have Marco Boer. And uh, the reason why I have asked them to join me for this uh, chat is because I got a uh, I, I got a press release from Printing United Alliance a couple of days ago, and maybe a lot of people really didn't read it or or, or understood the consequences of the content of this uh, press release. But it was basically about something that is called taxonomy, and uh, we're going to talk about that for the next few minutes here. And uh, before we do that. Uh, why don't we just ask our guests to introduce themselves a little bit more formally so we know who they are and what they do. So why not start with you, David? Uh, my name is Dave Zwang. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm in the industry. I'm an analyst. I'm a writer. Uh, I'm an educator. I, uh, I, um, the, I'm the chairman of the Gen Work Group. I sit on the international standards bodies. And basically, I've been playing in the industry for over 40 years, so I'm uh, very much uh, um, a graphic artist, I guess, or a printer, or whatever we're whatever we're going to wind up calling ourselves. I would say that uh, with with that introduction and that uh, curriculum vitae, I think that you have a good background for what we're going to to, to talk about anyway, right? <laughs> and um, Marco Bohr, who are you, and what do you do? So I'm the younger version of David, um, so <laughs> or at least aspiring. I, uh, I'm with a company called IT Strategies, and we do mainly future product development uh, for the digital printing industry. So we go out and we research you know, hundreds uh, of end users, as we call them, commercial printers, textile converters, packaging converters a year, trying to understand what they need for their next products. Uh, we speak a lot of industry events. I'm the chair of the Inkjet Summit. Uh, the co-chair of the Digital Packaging Summit, and, uh, you know, like David, very passionate uh, about seeing our industry remain vibrant. And that's part of the reasons why Printing United came to David and me and said, look, we need a little bit of help um, in making sure that the greater world uh, of manufacturing, if you will, because print is really a manufactured product, uh, we want to be able to track what's really happening in this business. And, and you know, sadly, in some shape or in form, the, the governments that used to track this as a, a part of manufacturing have basically given up. And, and they only look at the negative data, if you will, without really understanding how the market for print ha has dramatically fragmented into all of these other specialties. And when you add it all collectively, right, particularly when you add in package printing and the likes, printing is actually a really stable business but it doesn't necessarily appear that way. Hmm. And for, for those who are listening to us right now and watching us right now and don't understand what we are talking about, uh, let's dig a little step further down because the, 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 the topic of today is essentially how we organize all the work we do so we can use it for import-export statistics, we can use it for uh, having a unified kind of code for what kind of products and services we deliver. Is, isn't that correct, David? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and the, the, the uh, kind of the, the industry, the global industry has uh, kind of hooked on to something that that was uh, initially uh, presented back here. And I guess it was the 90s. Uh, and they, they, they call them sick codes or NASICs. And and uh, and, and they're, they actually define um, or are supposed to define different types of manufacturing, different types of businesses, et cetera. And, and the problem is that there's really no representation that within this organization um, to identify and to keep up with and to promote uh, what it is that printing is. And as, as Marco said, I mean, printing is, is huge. It's, you know, it's interesting. I was, uh, as, as we've started this, I've been contacted by uh, a lot of different people who, you know, understand the value of, 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 of what we're doing. And, um, and yeah, I mean, the, the fact that, that the, the current system doesn't uh, represent the business as it stands today, for sure, as it stands, if it doesn't understand, it doesn't represent it as it stands today. How's it going to represent it as it stands tomorrow? And this is a business. This is a an industry that's actually evolving and growing, and actually at a, it's evolving at a very rapid rate now. You know, it's it's not just 
what happens inside of a printing plant. Printing is much bigger than that. Yeah, and there's another issue. And there's another issue to this as well, because I mean, uh, one thing is the, the all the the obstacles you just described, David. But Marco, it's also a problem that when we look at the data, it's not even compatible with Asia and Europe and America, right? So we also have a an international because we get more and more in a, into a globalized economy and globalized businesses, and then then we don't have something that can be relatively easy to compare, right? So Dave is the one who who got onto this early on, and he basically said, look, if you look at global standards, whether it's for cars or apparel or whatever, there's a body called GS1. It's the old universal product code that established the barcodes years ago. Uh, and there is no representation of print among this global standards committee. I mean, it's shocking really to think about it, given the size of our industry. And so our goal is if we come up with a taxonomy that can be deployed on a global basis, and oh, by the way, we will try to work with GS1 to incorporate a new standard for tracking that print, then that is going to have a huge benefit, right, to be able, as you said, really track imports, exports, and get down to a much greater level of minutia to really understand what the trends are. Now, I'm going to go one other step further, and this to me is a big thing, and that is... I personally believe how we buy print is going to change dramatically. You know, for years we've been a very personalized kind of business, right? Relationship oriented. As we go forward and the world does move more and more towards digital printing, things become more democratized, meaning it's easier to contrast and compare, right? And so that's going to have a huge effect on how people shop for print uh, with the ultimate effect that we're going to buy stuff more online. As that happens, you need to be able to find that, let's say, specific application of dome printing. I don't know if you know what dome printing is, but it's basically raised character printing. So the badge on the backside of your car is usually some kind of you know metallic looking raised thing. That's called dome printing. Well, how are you going to find that unless there's a code associated with that online, right? And so the idea that you know Amazon has and Google, if you want to sell something on Amazon today, you have to have a GS1 code that allows you to then search that within the Amazon network. Um, And same with Google. So if print doesn't have any representation, how the heck are you ever going to find it, right? You're going to find bits and pieces, but not the entire uh, potential. So the need for standardization is huge. And and let's take it one step further. I mean, so so as as a manufacturer, Let's say I'm a press manufacturer, and and right now um, presses are evolving as well. They're turning into uh, more bespoke kinds of machines, etc. But as a press manufacturer, how do I identify how big a market is? How do I enter as as a as a service provider? How do I understand what my opportunity is in a specific market if we can't do it in a uh, with a universal language um, and and are able to look at it? Uh, as Marco said, just based on on, on, a, on, on a on a universal number set, because t- don't forget, you know, we look at this on a global basis. Yeah, languages are going to vary, and different people call things different things, and that's okay because if we have a number, we can associate it and, and map it against whatever the language is. That's not a problem. Hmm. So. Um... Before we're going to talk a little bit in details about what it is uh, you're going to work with, because it's it's still like in the in the in the early early beginnings, right? Uh, I would like to ask you. So, in uh, both of you are very experienced and talk to a lot of vendors in in uh, in a lot of different segments in our industry. So, if you look at how are people actually gathering data today, is that more like an emotional kind of understanding of what kind of technology is used, or is it the big surveys uh, also used uh, by the media, or how or how do they get the data? I mean. If you look at uh, key point intelligence, if you look at uh, I, I, IDC, if you look at some of the research companies, uh, uh, obviously they have for years tried to figure out how to get data that is relevant for the vendor side as well. So, so can you t- explain a little bit how it's done today? Well, I can tell you how it's done on the digital side, but that misses the entire conventional world of print, which, oh, by the way, still accounts for you know, 90, 95% of all things that are printed, right? So we have um, to remember that, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, we all love digital print, but the reality is that's, you know, not how things are produced for the most part today. It's a high value specialty. 
So anyway, on the, on the digital side, of course, it's relatively easy, relatively, to track because you track the number of machines that are sold, you track what the average monthly print volumes are, you get the total number of pages printed, and you try to tie that back to the paper industry statistics, which, oh, by the way, are probably the best measurement uh, of trying to understand what's happening in the print industry overall. So uh, it's an easy way to, to quote unquote, easy way to track that. Of course, there's individual segments, right? And this is where it gets really complicated because, you know, you've got trade groups. Like this morning, I was dealing with uh, some of the, the book trade groups, right? And, you know, the book industry during 2020 had a remarkable year. Uh, in fact, totally, you know, total revenues for books were completely flat. However, if you start peeling apart the layer, the educational book printing market was down 20%. Trade books were up 12%, right? And But it's a much bigger piece of that market. So, you know, is the market healthy? It's hard to tell, right? And what's happening within trade books? Because, you know, specifically in the U.S., 50% of all trade books sold go through Amazon. And guess what? They have a very, you know, rigid supply chain. And so the slow boat from Asia to bring all these books in doesn't work anymore during COVID. And so we've seen a huge uptick in digital printing of books. Anyway, I'm off on a tangent, but but the no, point no, is- No, no, but that, but that is fine because I can tell you that uh, when I read the press release and I invited you, uh, I knew that the impact was probably going to be way bigger than I could imagine because my knowledge about this subject is, is limited. But I Im immediately realized that you are onto something that I believe is important. But I was not aware that it basically also have an influence on, on customer behavior and, and, and what you both just said that the fact that you can have like uh, GS codes, uh, GS1 codes that are used across uh, all the channels where we normally buy our stuff can then be redirected back to the manufacturing process so it gives us better information and understanding of everything. It's just, I mean, just the thought is just amazing, right? Let me, let me put something in perspective. I got a, a fascinating uh, example that was sent to me. Uh, and this is from a professor. Actually, he's a retired professor at Cal Poly. Uh, and, and, he said, and he said one of the examples he used with his students was, he said, I, I, I got a box from Amazon with a pair of Clark shoes in it. He said the box was printed. The tape that sealed the box was printed in two colors. The shoe box was printed, embossed, foil stamped, and die cut. The shoes were wrapped in polyethylene that was printed. There was printed tape. Uh, tissue paper in each in each shoe. There were two quality control stickers of, on on the shoes that were of course printed. One in the box lid, two in inkjet inventory control labels printed on the bottom. So in 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 this one box, there were thirteen different types of printing and printed product. Fascinating when you think about it. And we and this is this is so all fascinating. Print is, yeah. is is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. But how do you define? What those things are? How do you define the value, the opportunity value? How do you define? I want to make machines. I want to be a printer. I want to make printing machines. Well, I want to do those stickers. Well, what kind of stickers are those? What do they need? How do they? What's the volume? What's is it worthwhile even bothering to go into it? Those are the kinds of things that you 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 are able to get when you have the appropriate information. And then and then the, the funny thing uh, to put a little salt in the in the open wound is maybe even <laughs> is maybe even that that the dimension uh, is uh, is uh, is all the applications you just mentioned but also then we come to the level of substrates i mean the, i mean the the spreadsheet covering all these uh, things will be vast right it will be enormous so, so martin you know what one of the instigators behind this whole project was thinking of salt in the wound, right? In the U.S., and it's just a little part of the world, right? Um, the U.S. government stopped tracking. I never heard an American saying that. That was uh, wow. fascinating, <laughs> so, so to speak. <laughs> I'm not American. But anyway, I, I am a U.S. citizen. But um, anyway, the, uh, the issue was that the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which tracks jobs, stopped tracking the print industry because they said it's gotten too small. And that has huge implications on lobbying, right, for government support for different things. And so that is what was really the original genesis to say, wait a minute, we're not that small, right? We are hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue. Um, you know, we need a seat at the table. And the only way to get there, right, to open people's eyes is to have really good data and to have it the ability to slice it and dice it and really give you an accurate composition 
of what's really happening. And, and so that's what drove it. And, and then when we started looking into it, Dave was quick to point out again, you know, there's no global standard. So here's our opportunity to really, if we do this right, right, and, and we're going to have a standards committee. That's really one of the reasons why, why we're, we're promoting this is because we're going to need experts in the various sub application areas that help us make sure that we capture everything accurately. And, and you know, if there's disputes and inevitably, right, somebody's going to want to call something a little different than somebody else. How do we come up with a process to say, look, you know, there is no such thing as nano ink. You know, it, it is ink. And I'm just giving a hypothetical example, right? And you can see how this could go a thousand different ways. So um, we want to make sure that you know there's a standardized way, right? To classify these things. And, and, and more importantly, oh, oh, just to add on to what 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 uh, Mark was saying, the other thing with this standards body that we're uh, or this this advisory board that we're putting together is that it will it will be there so that it's you know they can meet on a whether it's annually or whatever to update these things so that we don't have to go through the same thing 20 years from now and say what happened to the industry you know it, it, it disappeared again and i can't help think about um, both of you probably have tried this uh, yourself as well but uh, just to take it to a layman's level for a second uh, i can't help think about that when when a printing company invest in for example a web to print solution just defining the products that you have in your online shop and all the variables you have there i take that if you have like standardized measures uh, even the web to print suppliers and the mis suppliers could have standardized kind of product definitions that would enable people to get to work much faster and also to track all the things in their in the entire manufacturing process that would be way easier to handle is that is that correct or well, it, it, it's absolutely a, a, one of the things that could come out of it. Um, you have to understand that, you know, building the taxonomy, getting everybody to agree. And, and when I say everybody, I'm talking about the, the, everybody within the circle of who's putting this thing together, right? To agree is one thing. Getting it implemented across the broader industry is a that's a that's a huge that's a huge effort. It, it, it's going to require a lot of marketing. It's going to require a lot of education because people have to understand what the value is to them. You know, it's like, well, well why should I do that? Why do I should? Why should I? If I put the same code in that this guy does down the street, does that mean that they're going to start uh, shopping based on code? And if I'm not, you know, if, if my mine is three cents higher, they're not going to buy from me. Things like those are the kinds of things that happen. They happen today. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see, right, how this all shakes out because we could come up with the most beautiful taxonomy. But if nobody adopts it, then it will have been totally useless, right? Um, and that's why it's so important that an organization like Printing United Alliance, which is really now by default the single, you know, most powerful trade group in the world for print, uh, and, and they're mostly U.S., right? They're not global. Um, but if they take a lead on this and we get also the buy-in at, at a GS1 level, then that sets the stage really to, to allow this to come all together. And as David said, you know, we're not here to do this forever. We want to put the infrastructure in place, right, with a, the bylaws and structures and, and then allow it to evolve over time. I can't help think about because I uh, I spoke with uh, Fort Bowers uh, some time ago. That was when the PIA merged into Printing United Alliance, and uh, I can't help think about because I I know also in America there has been like you kind of. Uh, uh, maybe Printing United is becoming too big. I know that you're not representing Printing United, but I can't help think about that. This is actually an example why size matters, because you have the lobbying uh, with the acquisition or the or the the joint venture with Idea Lines, with you guys coming on board. I mean, that is the what a global organization can do, which will be totally impossible if it wasn't because of the size. Because if it was, if it was a tiny little organization from Boston, I mean, uh, how should you ever get that kind kind of regardless of Boston is a good place I mean how should you get how should you be able to get that to the authorities to the I mean because the impact is both on on legislation on standardization on the DS1 on on the manufacturing I mean so so the impact that printing united is taking this responsibility on the shoulders I show that they are really taking on a leadership role here 
the fact that they're willing to do it in an open way to engage the rest of the world on this thing because they understand the importance of it and the, and, and 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 look you know it, it is it is very much a global uh economy and uh we you know uh, you know heidelberg sells presses everywhere xerox canon all these companies sell sell this equipment everywhere right um and uh, and and there are a lot of uh, manufacturers and there are a lot of uh, people who actually are service providers that actually have they they sell globally they don't just sell locally um, so it's important to have that that breath and the fact that they're willing to take this on and and say yeah we want to do this to help the industry i think is very important there's a little selfish interest here too by the way because you know they are a, a very large trade show provider right for the print industry and you know as we get new definitions so so for example 10 years ago the word direct to shape was meaningless right today it means you're able to print directly onto a bottle using digital printing technology um so how do i find that if i go to printing united you know how do i classify that inside the trade show guide so to speak so it matters on so many levels Marco, um, one thing is the foundation and the Printing United taking this in initiative, uh, and also understand that it's open source. Understand that it's it, it's you're defining the the bylaws and everything around that uh, that hopefully to be standard. Um, how do you get started with the work? I mean, what do you do literally? David has started with outlining the taxonomy structure, and that's really critical because. So he's been looking at, and, and I'll let you speak to it, David, but, but all the existing taxonomies that are out there, uh, and, and of course, they don't really align, right? But, but you want to marry the best of it. Then you get into the complicated piece of, so how many layers can you have, right? Do you draw, drill down two layers, four layers? Or do you go vertical? Do you go horizontal? How do you get into the detail of all of these things? Like, so you can imagine a T-shirt printer, an inkjet printer, which could be a desktop device, uh, could be a you know a, a rotary screen with inkjet device. You could be printing on white cotton t-shirts, on dark polyester t-shirts, and so you got to be able to drill down right to get to that exact number. Um, and so that's the first start. And and once we have a good idea, um, I'm working on at the moment trying to figure out how to set up a standards committee right to get the right people on board because we're going to need not just you know consultants like David and myself, but you're going to need to have representation from print providers who, who live and breathe this every day. And that's got to go across converters for packaging, textile, commercial print. You've got to have some OEM uh, equipment and supplies manufacturers on board because part of the reason is they have to buy into it, right? If they don't buy into this taxonomy, then what's the point, right? And then at the same time, we can't have 100 people on this committee because nothing would ever get done, right? So how do you set it up in such a way that A, people want to participate, B, you know, there's some kind of term limit because you can't depend on the same people forever, right? Because then it becomes a proprietary structure. It's got to be really open. Yeah, David, I can't help because, I mean, you have some experience from the Ghent work group. I mean, I know it's a total different game, but it's also defining standards, of course, in a different scale. And and both of you are, of course, familiar both with, with the CIF4 and other standard committees like uh, uh, Idea Alliance and, and also the, the European Pandang to it. Um, I was just wondering, uh, your experience about defining standards and rolling it out to, let's say, vendors who should adapt this, what is your experience with that? So it's an interesting question, Morton, and it's something I've been living with uh, with the Gen Work Group for about twenty years now. Um, and it's uh, you know the the uh, if you build it, you know, will they come? Uh, well, that that's really not a great way to do it because you just put all this effort in, and then it just sits there and lays flat. And and that's not a, that's not a, that's not where you want to be. So really, what you want to do is you need to try to get engagement. And you need to get engagement, but, but you also need to get it in such a way where the big guy is not the one who's trying to force it on the smaller guy, because it, you really, it has to be democratized. It really does. And you have to allow everybody who has, has an interest 
and and uh, kind of a, a a stake in the game uh, to be able to be part of the discussion, because if you get that, then they're part of what's being built. They've already at that point, as you're building it, they're part of it. So they, you know that they're going to continue. They're going to adopt it because they're part of the build. Um, and that's really what you have to do. And that's really the way most standards organizations work. Uh, it's not just again work group. That's how ISO works, etc. I can't help think about because when I look at um, a Ghent work group is uh, is a software. So I mean, it's relatively easy to implement updates because I mean, it's an update, right? That you people get anyway think that one of the hassles with the the SIP 4 was that it was very much hardware based so it, I mean and you know these depreciation times are different uh, how you actually address issues can be different from manufacturer to manufacturer um, but I can't help think about that in in a times where IOT and where the purchasing behaviors are changing and all the things that we have been talking about now is changing also because of technology maybe one of the reasons why people should adapt this is because it's it could be money in the bank by adapting these uh, these standards right yeah so i was thinking about money in the bank right so um oh yeah you were thinking or hoping or whatever you did <laughs> well, no, no. Um, but but that comes about from different ways right so um a from the equipment manufacturer perspective right it enables them to get a much broader view of what's really eligible right to make the next generation of equipment and the next versions of, of equipment from the commercial print provider or com packaging converter or textile converter perspective it is they're able to reach a much broader audience right if they can properly define what it is that they're actually offering um and, and from a government perspective right they're going to be interested to catch this because it will also help them with tax revenues and the likes. So, yeah, in the end, if you don't all speak the same language, it's really hard to quantify something um, and, and to really spot the trends in these markets. But I w when I said follow the money or uh, banking on this, I was also thinking that you sometimes when you introduce a standard, let's say you do a standard that is smart, but doesn't really improve your 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 economy, right? Then then you might be reluctant to implement because sometimes changes requires more than doing nothing, right? And I was just thinking that at some point maybe uh, with with a better taxonomy and also the, as you be, as you described in the beginning, the fact that you can better stray things, you can maybe open up for selling your products and service into new channels and new ways of doing things. That is something that I would take could implement this faster than other standards because basically by adapting a standard that you can use for free you basically get options that you wouldn't be able to get if you didn't do it right uh, absolutely and you know it, it's interesting and, I, and i'm going to go back to the again work group only because there's a there's there's something that's going on now that makes perfect sense that kind of follows along with you with what you're talking about so you know we've been developing different kinds of standards and, and best practices for years right and in different in, in packaging and publishing and commercial print etc and and some of it was it was really a matter yeah we defined it we Everything is good. We've tested it. We know it works. It's good. But how do you get people to adopt it? And how do you then validate that? And what's the value to them? And uh, we, we've we now started to do that. We were actually starting to uh, have a program where people can um, test their workflows. And by testing their workflows, they're learning. They're learning what is it that's wrong with it. Uh, once I test it and they're so they're learning they get a you know they'll get a seal when it's all done a little sticker that says yes you did it and you did it right good but that's that's the kind of thing you need to do there's a value there you know as, a, as someone who's doing it better that means they're doing it more efficiently there it's probably lower cost right they've optimized processes and that's really what we're talking about here it's ra why reinvent the wheel if everybody can actually kind of work with the same lingo franco, you know? So, so more to come back to the, the adoption of this, right? The only way it's going to work is Printing United plus David and myself, we're going to have to lobby like crazy, right? First of all, among all the equipment vendors to, to really, you know, help them understand why this is so important to their business. Um, and they've got to assign somebody within their company to basically be their representative. And that person, you know, frankly, they're not getting paid, right? At least not by us or by Printing United. So it's an honorary position, right? But it's hugely important because if they that individual does that job well, 
his stature within the company will rise tremendously, right? So um, it, it's mutually beneficial if we get it right and we get buy-in, and that's the key. One of the things that uh, you mentioned, guys, was uh, the fact of uh, having these kind of uh, honorable, honorable uh, kind of ambassadors, kind of people working from uh, the companies. Uh, when this announcement was made, uh, do you already have people on board the committees, or is it really that early that you have not even talked to anybody yet? People have been contacting us, uh, and we want more people to contact us. Um, and what we've said uh, is that uh, we're putting together the uh, the bylaws. We're putting together the structure for the organization. That's one of the things that Marco's been far focusing on. Um, and and uh, we're putting this thing together. And once we have it together, then we're gonna st we're gonna look and we're gonna say, okay, so what? Really, what do we need? It's not just about getting bodies. Because it's not that we want a lot of bodies. What we want is we want people who are going to bring value to what we're doing, who are going to bring um, kind of their perspective and and uh, and as I said before, their their, their engagement, um, um, and we want to balance it. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, totally great, guys. Um, we are on the half hour here, so we're just about to stop. Unless you have something, uh, I have a few more questions. But uh, do you have anything that we should talk about that you find find important to to uh, to the conversation? Because the last questions I'm going to talk about is more when and how long time should we wait for having something that is useful. But uh, I don't want. I don't know if you want to answer that question now, or if you have. I mean, basically, I wanted this also to be your opportunity to. Uh, to talk about the project and I wanted to you know try to figure out the things around it and get into it so I don't know if you have anything that we should we should talk about here no I mean I think this is partially a project of passion really for, for both David and I because we want this industry to go forward right we spent our careers in it and, and uh, it's really it's as simple as that if you look in terms of you know when and all that our goal is by the end of this year, because this could drag on right forever and ever, we need to have something in place by the end of this year in structure. Uh, and then we'll probably continue on for another few years in terms of lobbying the various industry bodies and the likes. But uh, we have to have something concrete done, you know, before December. But it's going to be a live, it's going to be a live uh, organization because the industry is live is a live organization it's constantly changing and constantly evolving so this you know while we we are marco says yeah we're gonna you know we're gonna by the end of this year we're gonna have this and we're you know we're, we're committed we've got dates on it at this point uh, we'll have something that doesn't mean it's the end of the story it's almost the beginning of the story at that point but I didn't think of it as the end of the story. I, I just think that sometimes when you build something, I mean, you have the planning phase and you have the the starting of the execution phase and the and the moment that you present the website kind of thing is where you say, okay, now we tell the world <laughs> what we're doing and what to expect. And I was, you know, thinking where where does it, because I mean, when you get an announcement, I think it's also a way for Printing United Alliance and you guys to reach out to the communities to act, actually say, come, now we are ready to get started come and help us right uh, but that you know from there to you actually have something that you can say ah, this is a book or this is a website or this is a standard uh, I, I thought actually took a little bit longer time so is it a is it almost like a full-time job for you two guys then well we hope not but <laughs> it's one of these things where if it's a passion right you, you just put in the time and uh, since both of you only work like four or five hours a day you can spend maybe half oh, more sure. right? yeah. three days a week yeah <laughs> <laughs> See, I come from Denmark, but that is the when we're in a socialist country, we don't really work. So you know that how it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's just kidding, guys. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I wish you the best, and uh, and uh, as usual, if uh, anything in relation to this or anything else you're talking about is uh, relevant for you to uh, have a conversation on English uh, to publish, always welcome to reach out. Uh, it was a uh, it was great talking to you. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your support, Martin. All right.